No, we come together. Hope you come with anticipation that God wants to do something with the community of believers as we're hanging out together. I know we're in very unique times, uh, so I know we don't have as much fellowship stuff happening. Now, you're probably not having as many people over to your house. Maybe some of you are, um, but I know, you know, there, there's, there's a reason we're created to be in community because we need, we actually need one another. And it's awesome just to spend time with one another. At least once a week, we get to hang out together, which is really pretty cool. So this morning, we're going to continue on in our series called This Is Us as we've been going through the Beatitudes. Uh, we're just kind of taking our time going through this one little step at a time. Uh, I know next week, we're going to have a reprieve of this. We're going to do something a little bit different next week. Uh, but then the following week, um, our youth pastor, uh, Brant's going to actually share with us, which will be really exciting. So you want to be here for that. Uh, this morning, um, we're going to continue on, but, you know, just in review a little bit, you know, because it's quite a, a a blessing or a privilege to really hear from Jesus. You know, I know we did a series um, called Look What, Look What, uh, I can't remember what the series was. Brent and I were always talking about that. We could never, never remember the name of it. Look What Jesus Said or Look What Jesus Did or whatever. But um, in that series, we just went through scriptures, just talking about what Jesus said and and here he's speaking to, as we've said before, to the disciples, but also to the crowd, to the people. Um, and just a privilege just to hear him. And hopefully, as you're reading the Bible, uh, you do it in such a way that you actually are, are reading it as if, because this is the truth, right? That he's speaking to you. That this is to you, sometimes personally, and sometimes corporately. And sometimes we're learning things from others' experiences, but the Holy Spirit is illuminating, is teaching us as we're reading the Word. And it's a blessing to do that throughout the week and also to come together in community groups, come together here corporately. You know, we've, we've been talking about, you know, how being poor in the Spirit is a realization that we need redemption, that we, that we understand our poverty apart from Christ. And so to have that mentality, that sense of understanding that in doing so that that the kingdom is ours, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is ours. And, and understanding that condition of hopelessness brings us to a place of, of sorrow in and of ourselves that, man, look what we've done. Look at how in, in, in creation, when we have creation, we have the fall, then we have redemption. And, and sometimes we don't dwell enough on the fall. We don't realize what has happened to us. And, and, and we could just all of a sudden go through life just not thinking about what we've been saved from. And there are thousands upon thousands of people that have yet to realize the damage the fall has done to them. And they think they can just kind of trudge through life and, and it'll be okay when it, it absolutely is not okay. It absolutely brought complete separation. In creation, we have this perfect opportunity to be in this amazing relationship with God. And then we break the relationship. But then we have the story continuing. We have the redemption story. That the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about showing us how he's redeemed us. How in our own efforts to do works and to try to approve of his love, he says, hey, I'm going to send my love to you. I'm going to pour it out in the form of a person named Jesus Christ. And now we walk in that amazing realization that because of Jesus, we are now in position to be in right standing with him. But we live in a world that has a different worldview, Right? That doesn't see things the same way as maybe you or I see things. Or maybe you're here for the first time and are listening for the first time. And you as well have a different worldview than Christians would have. And I think it's important for us to be okay with seeing that, that distinguishable differences. And to, allowing the Holy Spirit to draw people into a biblical worldview. Because sometimes we can be condemning of those that... that Think differently, believe differently, sin differently than we do, right? I mean, we could be judgmental about that versus, hey, I'm going to stay true to what I believe and what the Holy Spirit has revealed to me. And in doing so, let that be an illumination that we have, that we have every right to stand strong and confident in what we believe. We're not a, a lesser species because we're Christians. It's like, wait a minute. It's like, it's like we have this... A vivacious, powerful Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, that has impassioned us for the things of God. And so as we live with our Christian worldview, we're called to thrive 
in this place that is our inheritance, as we talked about last week, as the meek are to inherit the earth. And so that sense of, as we walk in the sense of our Christian worldview, and we walk in a world that we can thrive in. We don't have to be sequestered away into our corner of silence, and, but we have something to be bold and confident about. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's that understanding that, that this is our life. This is who we are. This is us as we're reading the scriptures. And it's not our, we're not Sunday morning Christians that we are 24-7, even on the holidays, believe it or not. Even on your birthday, you're a Christian. You're a Christ follower. No matter what happens, you win the lottery, you're still a Christ follower. I mean, no matter what happens in your life, no matter what situations you go through, highs and lows, is that Christ is still the center of our attention, is on, is on him. But, but we live in a world that wants to separate an understanding of, of the natural things and what they would call the spiritual things or the mind things, the things, the feelings, the thoughts, the emotions. They want to separate those things. Um, Francis Schaeffer calls it a, a dichotomy of two stories, of an upper story and a lower story. And the, and the lower story always trumps the upper story. And so the naturalist, the, the scientist would say, hey, this is us. And then this whole spiritual religious stuff that will, will give you that because you need it to kind of make it through stuff. But really, it's all just fantasy. No, nothing's really real. And sometimes we buy into that as Christians that we just say, yeah, you're right. Okay, so yeah, at least we get something. At least we still have some place to do our stuff. Rather than realizing there are no stories for us as Christians. It's all Christ. It all belongs to him. And we're to walk in that understanding that, that we have a God that makes sense of it all. That, that brings clarity to the things that, that the world has a hard time understanding. Because all they see is what's inside the box. All they see is what's in there. But we understand that God operates outside of this realm. Outside of the things we even see and understand, God is beyond that. And that's where the definition, the understanding comes to us as Christians. To make sense of things that others can't make sense of. But our lives should be, I, I would say, translucent or transparent. And that, that people should be able to see through us and see Jesus. Right? As I mentioned before, we are, or we, each one of us that are Christ. That we house, that we are the body of Christ, that we that His Spirit resides. He chose to put His Spirit within us. We don't have to build a temple anymore. All right, in the Old Testament, the, the temple, the holy of holies, was the place where God lived. Well, now God lives in us, and oh, what a what a blessing that is. But it, along with it comes a bit of fear and trembling. When I think about. God living inside of me. And then to think about what I do with me. How does this temple that he resides in, how does, how does its steps during the day, are they truly ordered by the Lord or are they something that are ordered by Warren? Is, is it something that I'm doing in an understanding that God, the very God of creation has placed himself in me? And now as I live this life as his holy temple, is it honoring, is it pleasing to the Lord? Or am I still living, honoring and pleasing myself? Is it still about me? Or is it about, is it about him? You know, we've been looking at our condition, how we despise God in creation, desiring what we thought we needed to be like him, even though we were already created in his image, we, we took the Garden of Eden and, and spat on it. Like spoiled little brats, we took the most precious gift, eternal life, and chose death. And these first three characters as we've talked about are birthed from an, from an awakening of our humble state. A heart full of regret and sorrow. You know, we knew, well, we do know that we have a problem in and we're in desperate need of a solution. Now, here's what's awesome, right? That within these Beatitudes, this next verse is the solution. And oh, what an amazing solution it is. Um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this. If this verse is to you one of the most blessed, 
statements of the whole of Scripture, you can be quite certain you are a Christian. If it is not, then you'd better examine the foundations again. If this isn't something that just resonates with you and you are just excited about, then you should question and say, am I really truly a follower of Christ? Have I really made him Lord? Do I really understand what it even means to be a follower of Christ? But in this verse, it unlocks a solution to our, our problem. Even though we once stood toe-to-toe in enmity, in opposition to God, now, because of the good news, we've been restored, we've been redeemed, we've been brought back into relationship. So let's look at this amazing verse in, in Matthew chapter, I'm sure you've all cheated and already read it, um, because that's just what we do when we're sitting here and listening to someone talk. Um, but in Matthew chapter 5, in, and I'll just start in verse 1. You know, seeing the crowds, he went up in the mountains, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Or one translation says, they shall be feel, filled. And, and, and I and I probably should have done this before in, in our, as we're going through this, but I love that word blessed. You know, because I think about the times that I've blessed my children. I, 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 don't, I don't know one time when I've blessed my kids that my kids got super mad at me, super angry, couldn't believe it. How dare you bless me? I mean, I, I don't remember having that even the slightest bit of a negative reaction when we blessed our kids. It was always something that, that exuded happiness, right? That followed with joy and glee and like, oh my, because oftentimes blessings are those things that are oftentimes unexpected. It's like all of a sudden it's like, hey, I'm going to, hey, thanks for this, but here's this as well. I was thinking about this and I think you need this. They're like, are you kidding me? Oh my word, I can't, I can't believe that. And, and, and I, my kids, both of them, I was going to, no, never mind, I'll, just, I'll say both of them, because one of them is here today. Um, both of them are very gracious, generous people that, that respond back with, thanks, Dad, thanks, Mom. That's amazing. Oh, I, I so appreciate that. And, and I think we have to realize that, that this response is something that the world desires desperately to be blessed, to be happy. I, I've watched enough Instagrams and enough... Facebook, YouTube videos to know that people are out there looking for happiness and oftentimes they find themselves in the hospital, right? Because they're pursuing something that'll be, oh, this looks like fun. Let's jump off of this. Oops, ouch, 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 you know, and this happens. They're, they're on a tire swing and next thing you know, they're, it's broke and it's off into the rocks or something, you know, but there's this pursuit of happiness that takes place in the world that we live in, right? I mean, there, there's this hunger, this desire to be happy, and the verse says here, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What we have to realize is that just the pursuit of happiness is not going to make you happy. And I think that, that's, where, that's where we get, get off is that we think, well, if I'm happy, if, if I could find happiness in this, then I'll be happy. It's like, that's not, that's not how it works. You know, I, I, I wrote this illustration down, and I, and I think it relates to all of us. Um, probably all of us at one time or another have been to the doctor, right? At least once. I know you were there one time because you were, well, wait a minute, maybe some of us have their babies at home, so maybe not so. Okay, but most of us probably have been to the hospital at least one time, all right? Now, and usually we go there because there's a problem, right? And we're hurting, we have something wrong with my. I remember when I when I hit my head over when I hit my head with a with a stupid post driver. I, going to the hospital was was something I really had no problem doing because I was hurting and I needed some relief from this pain, right? And and so as you go to the hospital, you know what we're looking for is some type of relief. 
Now, in our minds, oftentimes what that looks like is that, is that I need some Oxycontin or some kind of morphine or Percocet or something, right? Something to get rid of the pain because it's just throbbing. What we need to realize is this is what the world has to offer people that are hurting. Is an Oxycontin, is a Percocet, is a morphine, is something that will give us quick relief from the pain. Now, maybe it comes in the form of, of sex, drugs, bad relationships, insignificant relationships, spending money, doing something. I mean, it, it comes in the form of something. There's a disconnect from the pain. You know, you think about there's kids these days, and maybe adults as well, that, 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 that cut themselves. Because the pain inside is so bad that they need to create physical pain to take their mind off of the pain. That's how real it is. They're looking for something to take a relief from the anguish, from what they've been going through or what, how, what life has, has thrown at them. And so they're seeking some type of relief, some type of, of happiness from the hurt. We must realize that the pursuit of happiness isn't the drug. Isn't you get the drug, okay, now I'm going to be happy. Now go into the doctor. I remember when I had my, my, my shoulder surgery, when I hurt myself playing racquetball. This was back in like 2010. And, and they gave me um, Percocet, right? And this is what the doctor said to me. He said, I, I'm, I'm going to give you this. You know, you're going to be on it for a little while. Then I need you to get off of it. Um, you, you actually need to start doing Tylenol and Advil and this combination thing. It says, you know, but right now it hurts and so take this. But then, but, I, but the, the objective isn't to make this a lifetime solution. This is just something temporary. And then I need you to, to stop taking it. Because they don't want us to be addicted to the happy pill, right? That, that's not the purpose of the doctor to say, hey, take this and then, hey, this will... This will fix it all. Just keep taking Percocet. The rest. Has any of your doctors... No, wait a minute. I don't want to sell anybody out here if there's a doctor in here that's done that. But hopefully none of our doctors have said, hey, this is a solution. Yeah, but I broke my leg. Don't worry about the leg. Just keep taking morphine. Because as long as you keep taking morphine, you're not going to feel the pain. Actually, you're going to do a lot of other things that you wouldn't do without the morphine. You're going to see things. You're going to act weird. And you're going to think stuff. But that I've never once, and I'm sure none of us have had a doctor that has suggested that's the solution to the problem. Because their objective is to actually get in and find out what the problem really is. And to bring true health to your body. And I, I think that can happen even within, within the church mentalities we're coming together. Is that we could think that this is an, that this is an expression of where we're going to be happy. By attending church, by wait a minute, the music's too loud, I'm unhappy. Wait a minute, stop that. Or, oh, that song isn't what I, oh, that preacher, I can't believe he did that. Or, or why does he wear that? Or why does he say that? Or, you know, or, or, or this is what happened when I was there. The mask wasn't worn by this person, it was worn. And my happiness is, and, and next thing you know, it's all about trying to be happy. And we're trying to find it in different places, whether it's outside the church or inside the church. But, but that's not the problem, see. And the fix isn't everybody wearing a mask or everybody not wearing a mask or everybody doing this or everybody doing that. That's not the solution. Because what we find as, as Christians is that we find ourselves in Christ. And as we continue reading this, this scripture verse, it gives us an answer to our happiness. It actually says here that it says that, that the pursuit of happiness is this, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessing comes to those who hunger and thirst for for righteousness. That's going to bring true happiness. You know, and I think it's so important for us to understand that in the pursuit of righteousness, in the pursuit of Christ, we said that he is our righteousness. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. Understand that righteousness comes as we come in closer relationship with Jesus Christ. We begin to mirror and the, his image. We begin to look like him and talk like him and act like him. It's just what happens because we found ourselves in a place of, of hungering and thirsting for Jesus Christ. For his righteousness. And as we're pursuing it, next thing you know, we begin to look like him. I, I love scriptures and we've, 
We all know these ones. In, in Galatians 5.22 that talk about the fruit of the Spirit, how all of a sudden love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, it becomes us. It becomes what we look like, the armor of God. We, we begin to walk in truth and righteousness and peace and faith in our salvation, the word of God in prayer. It becomes part of our function as we're living life. We begin to put on the things in Colossians 3, compassion, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, loving each other. And we see that as an expression of, of, of pursuing Jesus Christ, of, of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You know, I, I think we can easily take that scripture and go, wait a minute. Doesn't that mean we need to be more perfected and more and do more of these things, the A, Bs, and Cs, and we got to be more righteous? But when we start thinking that our righteousness and our actions, we go right back pre-Christ and pre-cross. And we understand that to be in right standing with God, we needed to be obedient to the word, be obedient to the law, be obedient to all the things that are being asked of us to do to be in right standing because we're a sinful, because we understand the fall. We understand our condition apart from him. Therefore, we're doing this so that we could have a relationship with him. But then we realize Jesus says, all right, good try, guys. I appreciate that, but let me just solve this for you once and for all. Once and for all, the cross, the final, the last sacrifice took place. And now we have this relationship that is in his righteousness. And remind that when I'm living this stuff out, it's a reflection of what he has already accomplished, what he has already done. And boy, do I love being part of what Jesus Christ has done. I want to look like him, talk like him, act like him. It becomes an expression of my life. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a verse that, you know, you read through marriage counseling and stuff like that. But it talks about what love is. Because this is a type of love that Christ has for us. So in turn, because we are in Christ Jesus, our love reflects the same kind of love. Patience, kind, does not envy or boast, not arrogant or rude, does not insist on its own way. Not irritable or resentful. Not rejoicing at wrongdoing, rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. When we find our righteousness in Christ Jesus, we begin to mirror him. We look like him. Here's the thing. The challenge, I think, that we face is that we think just by osmosis, that's just going to all happen. That I'm just going to begin to act this way, believe this way, talk this way, live this way. Guess what? I know you all. You don't behave this way. I know you know me. I don't behave this way. All right, I, I understand that, that this isn't always how I act. But yet, even so, there's this hunger and thirsting for it. It should be, it should be just growing up within us. I, 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 th th this is the thing. is God knew that we were going to be... I, I, we're not allowed to say the word stupid in our house when we were little, right? So you guys are all adults. But, you're, but God knew we were going to be stupid. We we're going to be idiots. We we're going to do dumb things. We we're going to still... Choose sin sometimes, even though righteousness is ours. He knew that. It's, it's, like, it's like my parents, right? When my parents, this was back in the day when, I don't remember how old we were. I'm sure it was legal, right? It's legal. You know, to leave your kids at home by themselves. All right? We did that. I mean, this was back in the day when you, when you, when you literally, when, it was in the, when you're in the car and it was sunny outside, if you want to get warm, you laid across the back seat so the heat from the rays coming through the back window would warm your body. We don't get to do that anymore, right? I mean, if you saw a kid laying in the back seat, you'd probably call 911, right? Be like, oh my word, these terrible, terrible parents. I'm like, those are my parents. I mean, that, that's how my parents treated us because they left us home alone. And I think what they hoped at the end of the day, it's not that my parents trusted us. Let's just get this right. My parents didn't like, oh, these boys are so trustworthy. Well, either, no, they had something to do and they couldn't bring the kids. Guess what? They're doing it. They didn't care. All they hoped when they came home, the house was not burnt down and one of the kids didn't die, right? As long as the kids are all alive, yeah, they might be bruised. There may be some broken bones. There may be some damage. There may be something happened in the house. That's fine. We, we, we can deal with that because we know our children. Just like God knows us. He, he knows that we're imperfect because of the fall. He understands that. But he also knows that he's empowered us by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us to empower us to say yes to righteousness every single day. That we can put these things on and live a new life in Christ Jesus because of what he has done for us. And yet, even in the midst of it all, 
I'm sure he's laughing his head off sometimes at some of the stupid things that we do, some of the crazy things that we say. Yet he's looking and goes, those are my kids. And my love for them is unconditional. My love for them is, is through Christ Jesus. Their righteousness is through Jesus, who in Hebrews it talks about, in 1 Peter it talks about how we are now hidden in him. He's placed us in his own son. And what a perfect position we're in. That, that, that it's not about our outward expression of righteousness. That God's totally aware that our perfection has to come through, through him. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we hungry? Are we thirsty for his righteousness? Now, now, now some of us might, I, have you, has anyone ever said, hey, are you hungry? And you said, eh, I, I could eat, right? I mean, you know, are, are you thirsty? Eh, what, do, what, what do you got? Well, I got a water. Eh, I'm good. You know, oh, I got this really nice, expensive wine. Ooh, yeah, actually, I am quite thirsty. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, we, we oftentimes want to kind of know, hey, what is before I'm, I'm hungry or thirsty? And I think what, sometimes we could read this verse and we just think, yeah, hungry and thirsty. Mm, yeah, mm, sometimes. Or yeah, yeah, I'm a little thirsty for right. Uh, yeah. I, and I think uh, one of the examples I love in scripture that I think resonates with me when I, when I think about this is the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son, is, he squanders all he has. He's living with the pigs. And all of a sudden he is starving to death. Starving. I mean, he's trying to eat the, the corn shucks and the, and the pea pods and, and trying to fight over those with the pigs. And, and, trying, and then all of a sudden he's realized, I'm dying here. I, I, I mean, if, if this is my trajectory, is this all that I have to look forward to? I'm not going to survive. And what does he do? He quickly remembers his dad and thinks, you know what? I don't even care. Even though I despised him, rejected him. And this is what we did, right? This is the fall. Despised him, rejected him, shunned him, ran away from him, chose death over eternal life. Even though that was my action, I'm so desperate. I'm so in need. I'm, I'm so hungry and so thirsty that I'm willing to face whatever, whatever. And what we realize in the midst of, of approaching, approaching our Heavenly Father, Instead of him shutting the door in our face and turning the lights off, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, maybe you've done this to me before. Approach your house, you quickly turn the lights off, close the doors, everyone's quiet. Everyone get down. He's coming. Don't let him in. That's not how he treated us. He didn't shut everything up and tell everyone to be quiet. Oh my word, there's that prodigal son of ours left us to spy. What does he want? Who does he think he is coming back to me? And th this is where wh wh whatever side of the, of, of the theology doctrinal coin that you reside on, whether Armenian or Calvinist, is that here's where, here's where you see this beautiful picture of a son coming to the father and the father coming to the son. And you see this beautiful sense of, of him choosing his father at the same time his father is choosing him. And this beautiful coming together and this unity of two people that were once broken, that once had an issue because of the choices they made at this very moment. There's a restoration and a beauty that comes because that's how much God loves his kids. That's how much he loves us. And so even the sense of being hungry and thirsty for righteousness, that, oh, would it not be the same situation where we would pursue him? And as we pursue him, we realize at the very same time, he is pursuing us. That he's running towards us as he sees us walking down the road. Next thing you know, he's running for us. And there's this warm embrace. As we're united once again. Are we hungry? Are we thirsty? For what Christ has for us. And then I love how he ends this verse. It's just simply this. For they shall be filled. They shall be satisfied. It's, it's, not, it's not a question of, it's not, well, they might be. It's going to happen. In, in your pursuit of him, and your hunger and thirst for righteousness, we're going to get it. 
We have it. It's not this sense of like, like this carrot dangling. Come on, try to be righteous. Oh yeah, here it is. Come on, keep coming. Run faster. Come on, if you go work a little harder, do a little more, attend church more regularly, tithe more regularly, do this more, maybe you'll catch the right. No, that's not what it was. It's that if you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, you will, you shall be filled. It's, it's the promise. It's that security in knowing that he's going to be there. His faithfulness is there. He's not going to all of a sudden turn his back. I'm just joking. Never mind. Shut the door. No, he's there. He's faithful every single time. This is the God that we serve. In John 6, it says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I'll never cast out. This isn't a game of catch me if you can type of a relationship. Your happiness, the blessings you so desire are found in him. It's in his righteousness that we find that we're satisfied, that we're sanctified, that we are made holy. And we're putting these things on. It's what we're doing. We're adding these things to our everyday life. We're putting on the love that is expressed in 1 Corinthians and and Galatians and and all the different places in Colossians and Ephesians and all the Gospels. And and as we're we're reading these things, we're reading these truths, we're like, yes, this is us. This is what I look like when I look in the mirror. This is what I see. And if I don't see those things, I fall on my face and go, God, forgive me for, for still living to myself, for still seeking my own selfish ambitions when I realize you've given me everything I need. Why am I still pursuing what I want when I know that all it is is corn husks and the shells of a pea pod? I mean, just, I mean, this is all it has to offer us. Church. I just wrote this. Why don't we stand? I'm going to pray for us here. I just wrote this. It says, churchless hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's ours to be had. It's not a dangling carrot. It's a banqueting feast. And that he said, belly up and eat to your heart's content. Belly up to his banqueting table and partake of all that's ours as Christians. It's all ours. All that Christ has for us is ours. Let's walk in it. Let's express it in our lives. Let's live it out as, as we're in our work, in, in, on the workplace and at home and on the street, wherever we might be, is that we're an expression of him, that we identify with Christ Jesus. We're not a quiet Christian. No, we're not. We don't, we don't care what people think about us because we know what he thinks about us. He captured my heart and I hunger and thirst for him every single day. Because that's where my joy comes. That's where my happiness comes. That's where my peace comes. Lord God, I I pray for us, your church. Truly, Lord, let this be us. Let us be a people that hunger and thirst for righteousness. That pursue you, Lord, with with such a desire, Lord God, that nothing will keep us from running after your righteousness. Lord Jesus, my life begins to exemplify, begins to look like you. My my, my speech, I begin to sound like you. I begin to act like you. Because I spend so much time with you. That you've rubbed off on me. That who you are is something that I say, man, I want to be like Jesus. I want to put Jesus on today. When I wake up tomorrow morning, God, let me exemplify you. Holy Spirit, As you live inside of me, guide my steps tomorrow. Holy Spirit, fill your church. Empower us to overflowing. Lord, your presence is there. God, make us so aware of it. Lord, I I pray that you're louder than than the tinnitus ringing in our ears. That you are ringing so loud that we don't even hear that little tinnitus buzz that's going on in our ears that that God that you just resonate so loudly that God everything becomes about you everything is about you and God we celebrate you Lord let us be the church this week in our city in our region beyond in conversations let us exemplify you in Jesus name and everybody said amen amen let's have a great week amen Hey everyone, I just want to say thanks a lot for watching the video today. 
really appreciate that. One thing you can do to help us out is by subscribing to this channel and then hitting you know, the bell, uh, notifications, making a comment. The more that that happens, the easier it is to find us. So if you can help us out, that would be great. Thanks again for watching us today. Have an awesome, awesome day.